for the censure of conflicting ideas, while ironically calling those who disagree with fascists, are gaining ground in trying to shut down free discourse. The one resource that has provided progress in the Western world is our ability to communicate and figure out the answers for ourselves. Tonight, we yet welcome Ms. Lauren Southern and Ms. Madison Faubel. Ms. Southern has gained ground as a young political activist, author, and internet personality who started her career in public life as a Libertarian Party candidate in Canada and then joined Rebel Media as a pundit. In her current role as a media personality, she explores what it means to be a conservative activist as a young woman. One young woman that has been extremely influential, influential in the conservative cause is Ms. Madison Faubel. Ms. Faubel is currently the chair for the Minnesota College Republicans and former chair of UMNCRs. Ms. Faubel has been on the front lines for defending constitutional rights of our youth on college campuses across the state and has garnered support nationally for her willingness to put herself at the risk of others to provide a better future for all in political spheres. It is my pleasure to introduce to you my friend and great patriot, Madison Faubel. The College of Republicans, and last year I was the president of the University of Minnesota College of Republicans. Uh, it's no secret that the leftist fascists on campus did not want this event to take place, but here we are. College campuses, nation, no exception. Right outside the building, there are dozens of fascists wearing masks and using their scare tactics in an attempt to shut down our event. Just like the United States government, we do not negotiate with terrorists, and our show will go on. Leftist scare tactics have not and will not silence our God-given right to free speech. Last year, my friend David and I were personally stalked, doxxed, and threatened by the so-called anti-fascist thugs outside our building. I will fight for their right to stand outside our event and make idiots of themselves, but they do not have the right to shut us down. Unfortunately, we are not their only targets. They threaten all conservatives on campus. They target anyone who does not agree with them. Why do they do this? To scare us, to put conservatives in retreat. They want us to be too afraid to stand in opposition of, to socialism, an ideology that has killed over 100 million people. They want to shut us down so that they do not have to face different ideas from their own. They will label you a fascist, or a racist, or a sexist for just attending this event. Yet they will not debate you because they fundamentally disagree with having an open dialogue and discussion. Why? Because they know they will lose. They only resort to scare tactics because they know there is no intellectual basis for anything they promote. Tonight, I am standing here to say that we will not be intimidated. We are not afraid, and we will not be silenced. The Bill of Rights does not succumb to the cowardice of basement dwellers in black masks, and neither do we. I want to thank the University of Minnesota for supporting our First Amendment rights and allowing this event to take place. I would like to thank the officers protecting our event. We back the blue here. I would like to thank the officers protecting the protesters' free speech rights outside. This event is a conglomeration of individuals who believe free speech is worth fighting for, and I am honored to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Madison. 
last century with those inspiring words. Uh, now for the main line of the event, uh, Lauren Southern is going to come up here and speak. Uh, everyone get excited for her? Yeah. <laughs> right now or I will sue you because I am about to change into comfortable shoes. <laughs> That's right, media, I'm suing you. Any of you that upload photos to be in my comfortable shoes. <laughs> good, good. Alright, awesome. Thanks. I almost went in a lot of slippers actually. <laughs> And do we have this up here working? Need my image support? Sorry guys, I'm not the entertainer. Is that me? I think that's you. God damn it. <laughs> we got the man. I see. Used to be a problem. Oh, there we go. Oh god, I'm actually kind of scared. <laughs> Is there actually a way I can shut this off before I watch it? Okay. Is anyone a member of Aid Pakistan? Yeah. Yeah, we got one guy. That's why I know there's nothing to this. <laughs> Her platforms to spread hate and bigotry. 
The university has recently approved to speak on behalf of CPAC and SEC using fees that you pay for. SEC? Sorry. No, no, they, they, they spelled it wrong. So, just to get this straight, I'm here doing a talk on the problems of socialism. And these protesters' greatest complaint with my speech is that they pooled their money into a collective. <laughs>
ruled in class. Of course, not you guys. You guys are the exception, though. I'm sure you realize that. Um, now, because socialists enjoy polling so much, the system would eliminate any gaps in grading to make it all fair. So if Tiffany received an A in class and Yoshiko got a D, then it would average out to a B. Of course, it's a You can't criticize capitalism. 
Not that fun, is it? It gets a little annoying. We will never live in a utopia, so let's not bother criticizing utopian versions of our ideas. Let's stick to the real ones. I don't think Adam Smith factored in the epidemic of anime body pillows while he supported the free market, but nothing goes quite as well as planned. And that is certainly the case in Venezuela, which has to deal with many sober and socialist realities to date. After the socialist state took full control of price factory goods, production was rendered unprofitable. This killed incentives to innovate, much like my terrible with the classroom. And Venezuela has become a single commodity economy, relying on the luck of having oil reserves. But relying on a single commodity is treacherous because soon before long the price took a nosedive, as did the state of Venezuela. You would think such basic principles as don't put your eggs in one basket would make it to the top tiers of the government of the country, but apparently they began those at the, uh, at the unfortunate risk of their entire nation. And now the Venezuelan people are literally using rare pet pepes as a form of currency. <laughs> I wish you were kidding, but that's how, that's how it forgot it is. They were so desperate to escape government currency that they had resorted to memes. Now, as crappy as all this is with the Venezuela situation, unfortunately, socialist principles are more than just an economic system, and the effect of its core tenets of redistribution of wealth and income to fund the welfare state impacts more than just your ability to get fat off chicken candies. It destroys the core of civilization itself. The family, which brings me to the second part of this talk, how socialism impacts the family and culture. Now, it might sound a little harsh to start this section by saying that socialism ruins the family itself, but if I'm being generous, the redistribution of wealth, at the very least, redefines the family. And I'm going to give you a quick rundown, not on the Bogdanovs, but uh, on just how bad <laughs> socialism is <laughs> on the core family structure. <laughs> Firstly, humans were a sexually dimorphic species long before they were social creatures and could create 200 genders. And certainly long before we tried to create any sort of large societies, let alone destroy them with stupid ideas like communism. And as long as humans exhibit their sexual dimorphic behavior and haven't replaced feminists with sex robots, there is a fundamental conflict with socialism and biology. In short, Men like to make. That's a fact of life. I know, it's such a beautiful way to say it. And to do that, they need women. They don't need cat people. They don't need gender fluids. They don't need tribe genders or attack helicopters or whatever the hell these are. I don't even need that one leg of speed at the But they need females. Now, the issue that most men run into is that women are generally picky. <laughs> if they have the choice between. <laughs> If they have the choice between a slob with ketchup in his belly button or Chad McGee here who goes to the gym twice a day and can lift a horse with his bare hands, they will pick Chad every time. That is, of course, unless the doorman here starts making millions, and suddenly the lady's panties will stop corrupting poor personality. <laughs> but seriously, historically speaking, they're working at women, men have to improve themselves. This is why capitalism works so well, because it follows the basic instincts of humanity working with, not against, their self-interest. However, socialism itself crushes dominance hierarchy. Progressive tax rates force hiring males down to the middle levels by robbing them of their hard-earned wealth, and wealth funding raises the bottom of society up to make sure that all men are equally in this lower category. Now, not only are these men in a place that they do not deserve to be, but when it comes to the latter group of welfare-receiving men, they are, in fact, motivated to stay there by government subsidies. Why would you work when you can get free shit? This leads to a problem. There is nothing more that women, well, some at least, love than free money from the state. And there is nothing more that they hate than a low-earning man that can't provide for them. So they keep circling around these men that have been equalized by the state, never finding Mr. Perfect that society has promised them existed. And thus, never settling down and getting married. The way you look. There we go. Men's status seeking nature is not some cursory behavior. It lies at the very core of a man's existential purpose, the state. And it's not just that competitiveness that has been taken away from him by the sex. That is 
that's something that most men want. And it's a husband that most females want. And uh, of course, unless you're taking gender studies and you think you can replace a husband with a glass of wine, some Cheetos, and a uh, rabbit, not the fuzzy kind, of course. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, that breadwinner of reality is getting further away as age grows. Where the hand of government compensates the father's resources in the form of taxes and dumps the money down the drain in welfare programs that support completely separate families. So instead of becoming fathers, men become taxpayers. They're doing all of the work of providing for your family while getting none of the benefits of having one. In other words, the welfare state supports single motherhood. And this isn't just a theory, this is something that unfortunately has come at an extreme cost. If you look here, with the total welfare spending, the spending that has gone up since 1950, the total amount of single mother homes and single father homes have gone at a complete boom. With a marriage to the government, welfare queens get all the benefits of the breadwinning husband without any of the responsibilities of actually being in a marriage. And even in the case where the man is involved with his family, Low-income women have every reason not to tie that knot because it puts them into a higher cash category. And that means that they would no longer be eligible for that money from sweet daddy bell. So it is no surprise that when you look at U.S. Census Bureau reports, there is a drastic increase of children born out of wedlock since the war on poverty. This stuff is astonishing. If you want to look into more of it, I would suggest Ann Coulter writes a lot of it about it on the impacts of the black community when they started the war on poverty there, and then of course Charles Murray has done some excellent work talking about these impacts. Now what's even worse than this is having the father completely estranged from the family is an even better economic choice for women as now there will just be extra alimony and child support payments which can go to get you a new pair of designer shoes. You do. That's not a joke. The pushing there is an epidemic of gun women can sign the shoes for the child support and break the government. Socialism's naive trust in humans to reject what appears to be their self interest will fail every single time. Socialists don't seem to realize that it is not just the haves that have the potential for greed and selfishness, but it is the have nots as well. Their ideology runs counter to biology itself and the human species' self-interest in nature. Single moms are bad enough in themselves, and no, I'm not talking about the widowed mothers, and I'm not talking about the mothers that left abusive husbands. This is a trope that leftists use in order to defend the increasing amount of broken homes in modern America and the West. I'm talking about being single mothers that are largely being fueled by incentives from the government and by feminist ideology tend to make less than ideal mothers as is. So the real consequences of this boom in single motherhood as a result of socialism is the fatherless child. Children with no positive male role model in their life will almost always end up screwed up. If you look here, the stats are ridiculous on poverty from married couples considering female-headed households, which is just a boom in poverty rates. Then, of course, you've got they're more likely to do drugs, more likely to drop out of school, more likely to commit crime, and even twice as likely to commit suicide. But one of the worst parts of this is that these single child, these single mother parents, or child, single mother children, are more often to repeat the destructive cycle that they have lived through at the end of their child as well, making sure that the cycle continues and continues on forever, leaving communities totally impoverished and fatherless. Taxation and wealth redistribution put the government between the man, between the woman, and between the children. And children raised in government's modern families become oversensitive, non-competitive, self-centered, and narcissistic after all the years of a mother's coddling. And this is because you need both. They need a positive male figure as well to counter that out. And no positive male figure means that these kids will never learn how to integrate their life. But why does it matter that socialism ruins the family? Why should we care about that? You know, the right regular feminists today, the gender studies professors will tell you that the nuclear family is toxic. It must be destroyed. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objectively revolutionary.
evolutionary process. It's patriarchal. Why don't we just say goodbye to it? Well, you have to be clear that it's deceit. Because, of course, any system like socialism or Marxism would want the destruction of the family. Because the family itself and destroying it is integral to more government control. If you have a mother or father to take care of you, you don't need government handouts. If you grow older and you have children to take care of you, you don't need the state. The destruction of culture, the church, and family is integral to the eternal reliance on the state. The family unit is the first step of a nation and a society, and you cannot replace the trust of loving parents, siblings, and spouses with cold bureaucracy. If you thought the end stages of capitalism with its overindulgence was poor bad, the estrangement of the family and the enslavement by the state are a far more hellish fate that we should at all costs avoid. The family is a microcosm of society at large, and as soon as you make radical changes in the dynamics of the average American family, you'll see that ripple effect in the broader American society, and that is what many in the government hope to see. They hope to see you estranged from your family. They hope to see you as only a number on a checkbook and a consumer, and someone simply to take a vote. I really don't think that the rise of the shrieking social justice warrior is a coincidence at all. And hell, the socialist funding education could be an entirely different topic on its own. But I think this is all the effect of the socialist grooming of the family and implementation of the categories of economics and education. But I will say beyond that, this two-pronged destruction, economically and socially, is ultimately leading to the fall of our liberal democracies that are oh so enjoyed by latte-sipping liberals who expedite their destruction from their ivory towers. And while I do enjoy laughing at just how ridiculous and hypocritical the people are outside with their chanting, I do fear that by the time the consequences hit them, and they come running to the capitalists that they rejected, to the conservatives that they censored, and to the statisticians that they ignored, it will be too late. But hey, while it all falls apart and we try to put the public pieces back together, we might as well enjoy it and laugh along with the Kaliuga. So here is one last meme for the road. We should have known communism would fail. There were a lot of red flags. <laughs> Thank you very much for speaking, Lauren. Uh, now we're going to have a Q&A session, and uh, we only have one microphone, or... Do we have a second one? Okay. Okay, uh, we can get a line going over there, and a line going over here. Yeah. And we have to hold the microphones, because unfortunately we've had some people not behave in the past, but I'm sure they'll be alright. <laughs> Right to work laws that are coming to the state 
that are saying that's illegal, you cannot be taking something like this out of someone's paycheck with no increased benefit. Um, it's becoming a very divisive topic, very divisive issue. That's a little annoying. <laughs> um, but also there are different benefits where for both sides, like you, need, you are getting an increased um, base salary paid for the position. So shouldn't you be giving in to that as well? How would you recommend addressing this issue in today's society? So would you recommend like um, focusing on the federal law, maybe having the maximum only 20% of um, the union dues fees or whatever it may be? How would you address the issue? See, well, I wish I were more of an expert and knew more about the topic, but for myself, a lot of my answers to these kind of questions is more freedom. You should have the ability to be in or not be in that union if you don't want to. Now, of course, I understand with some working environments, if you want to get a job, you have to be in a union. So in that case, more competition, the better. There are different unions that offer you different benefit, benefits for uh, how much you contribute. Then I think that would be the best to compete. But honestly, I would have to look more into this individual case to give you a proper response. But damn, 85 percent? That is criminal. <laughs> <laughs> That's Absolutely. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Eric. Um, hi, Eric. My question is a lot more simple than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, given the debt-to-GDP ratios of the United States versus oh, some other, um, <laughs> yeah, bear with me. So, just given the given the debt, we compare debt to GDP because it's not really fair to compare the size of our country to others. But uh, why are some of these democratic socialist countries have performing a lot better debt-wise than the United States, given how efficient socialism is? Can you give me a couple examples? Sure. Uh, the United States has a debt-to-GDP debt-to-GDP ratio of about 106 percent. So. Uh, um, Versus, uh, I have the, on my phone, give me one sec, uh, um, Finland 63%, Sweden 41%, uh, going down the list, uh, right. yeah, so, so why, why are they acquiring so much less debt if, the, if they're like inefficient socialist countries? So a lot of these cases are like comparing a uh, Starbucks chain to a local coffee shop. In the case of America, having a much, much, much larger population in these countries and also being involved in a lot more foreign affairs. Now, I disagree with America as being involved in all these foreign affairs. In fact, I would say that a lot of that spending, military spending and all of that, causes for a lot more of their debt compared to these more isolation and socialist countries. Those countries are still going to see failure. I mean let alone the migrant problems <laughs> that they are headed towards disaster themselves as well. But America is certainly expediating it with their involvement all over the world and their other expenses. Sure. All right, and one, one more kind of question for you. What about yeah. voting spins? I saw some uh, I so. interesting, any, any quick comments? Uh, no, I did not murder refugees in the Mediterranean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going on a boat with a few activists that were protesting an empty ship that was going to traffic migrants to Europe. And I was doing some of the documenting and I supported them. And I lit a flare in order so that we would have good lighting for filming. It was just a localized flare, it didn't go anywhere. But immediately RT publishes Lauren Southern fires flares at boat full of refugees. <laughs> Shoots torpedoes at drowning babies. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like I, I, the, I had the Associated Press calling me asking about it. It was ridiculous, but no, I lit a little flare for waiting. I did not fire torpedoes at drowning refugees. <laughs> 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 or anything in this class, it's, or in this question, it's more of a general question. Um, I'm sure I could speak for a lot of us here when we say we go to class and we face a lot of biased lectures and lessons from our uh, professors, not only on socialism, but very um, far left topics. Is there any advice you'd give to any students here that might feel they have their tongues tied because they can't speak their mind without facing a, a perhaps dropping grade at the hands of a biased professor? What advice would you give to students in that precarious position? Boy, see, there's, there's always, uh, it's a balancing act, I would say. The more people that come out as conservative, the safer you are. And as you can see, a lot of people know this event was almost canceled on the campus. But of course, a lot of people putting pressure for free speech, more and more students coming out, make it safer for other students. So, in the meantime, I would say, start by asking questions. 
I, I was actually talking just on the phone with uh, Stephen Crowder, one of his producers. I'm sure you guys know a lot of Crowder. Yeah. <laughs> they were telling me when they have leftists on their show, they always have to play that balancing act because they want to be able to debate more leftists on the show, but they also want to make sure they challenge them. So what they'll do is they'll ask questions, and they'll let the liberals trip over themselves, and they'll let them destroy themselves simply with the questions that they're asking. I still got in trouble for doing that in university because it's hilarious when you embarrass the professors because I'd just put up my hand and be like, hey, what about this statistic? Hey, what about this? Right? And just kind of contradict them. But it, it does give you a way to express yourself without sacrificing your future career and without sacrificing lower grades. Hi there, my name's Amos. Um, so, Matt, uh, you did a video a while ago, uh, kind of as a clickbait, the WTF, I know, and such, <laughs> basically kind of as a rant to why YouTube is the way it is, why people are putting up videos that are basically stupid, and why they're gaining as much attention. Why are people so drawn to just stupid stuff instead of a lot of the, essentially the content that you, someone like you might produce, you know, gaining traction, gaining in the mainstream. I was just curious if you, because you never really did a follow-up as to like if you gained any perspective on that, or if you kind of understood why, you know, why people behave the way they do. Um, I personally used to be an itinerant minister and dealt with a lot of Christians of all sorts of different uh, denominations, and could see a lot of as I learned different things and I shared with people. Similar with dealing with leftists, is you would share a new idea, and people would just get caught in this cognitive dissonance, we call it, and. Yeah. Have you, did you ever get any perspective on that? Or? Yeah, that's good. Anyway, I, I should do a follow-up to that. For those of you who don't know, uh, there's a YouTuber... Oh, I wish I could remember his name. Lance. Vince Vance? Lance. Lance, Lance, Lance yeah, Stewart. Yeah. Oh, he's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> he gets like 4 million or 5 million views a video, and he does fake paranormal activity stuff where he'll pretend he's getting possessed, and it's like so obviously fake, but he's like, oh, possessed in my sleep. There's millions of views, and people like myself and Black Ninja Speaks or any other political YouTubers will look at this and be like, why, why do I even try? <laughs> I just pretend to get possessed and get millions of views. <laughs> of course, it would be a little humiliating to our sensibilities, but the, the big answer to that is one of the driving factors of this is I think a lot of young kids click on this, so I think it's a lot of the 12 year olds that really get sucked into that. But the other side that is the more sinister side to this is a lot of these videos are being shadow banned. I think, I truly think a lot of political YouTube would be at the top of uh, trending, much like we saw, oh, I want to say, the whole crime act uh, about gun control recently at the top of YouTube. <laughs> Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel, right? So Jimmy Kimmel made it to the top of YouTube. Even though those videos are supposed to be censored, those are supposed to not be able to take to the top, they're not supposed to be monetized if it's about politics, he made it to the top because there's background manipulation going on. Without that manipulation, I truly believe that right-wing political YouTube would make it to trending every single damn day. But the hope there is that when we do in-person events like these, we are slowly changing the culture. We are winning over Gen Z like no other ideology. So that is, that is the important thing. My name is Julian. Thanks so much for coming uh, to our campus. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, agree with your approach to talking to liberals about opposing views. Like, I decided to take a gender studies course this semester. Um, You're a great man. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm very, I'm, I'm conservative, and it's, it's a struggle. And if you bring anything up, they will group mentality attack you until like, you don't even have to say anything that provocative. Like I asked my professor, um, you, you're talking like we have a thing called feminist science. And I was like, <laughs> uh, what do you what do you mean by feminist science? Why not just call it science? It makes it sounds like sound like it's not real. And then she's like, well, it is real because science is biased, and there's so many white males in science that there's no way it could be authentic and non-biased. Um, so. I don't think I'm going to win any arguments in that class, but, I mean, on a logical level, yes, but on a, people who agree with me and listen to that, anyway. Um, so in the class, there's a lot of people that are actually transgender and that have, like, switched their um, gender or sex to male or female um, when they were born. 
the other one. Whatever. Yeah, I and I know that you it legally switched your gender, yeah. or you had a video where you tried to do that. Um, what was the aftermath of that? Did you uh, stay? Did you like have that formally processed, or were you a man for like a day? Or the, the aftermath of that was a lot of strange looks at bars. <laughs> I know I haven't changed it back yet. I'm just too busy, and I actually. <laughs>
which is one big thing. Uh, I think that during a lot of the disasters, a lot of the natural disasters we saw recently, you feel strange because if you went over to your neighbor's house and you knock on the door, maybe they wouldn't even speak English when you go over there and you couldn't help each other during that disaster. Maybe they would get mad at me for having my hair down because they were Muslim or something. So the only person you have to look to is the government. They are the only one you have to look to for help. But before, our forefathers would have their community, their family. And I genuinely believe one of the solutions to this is looking back and trying to rediscover our identity as a society and culture, because they did exist within America and Canada, and making sure that we take the best kind of immigrant. And that is the kind of immigrant that loves and wants to assimilate a culture. We have to greatly decrease the amount of immigration that we have now, greatly. Otherwise, we will not save our Western civilization. The other two, the kind that are, and eh, don't really care, just came here for money, and the kinds that hate Western civilization, you got to get rid of those kind of immigrants. And that's uh, what I truly believe is one of the few ways we're going to save a community in the West. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Zach. Uh, before my question, just a quick bit of good news is that in the last election, 48% uh, of people between 18 and 24 voted for Trump, but only 43 for Clinton. Here in <laughs> but my question is rather simple, so your response can be as simple or complex as you like, is what is the ideal function or role of the state? Just generally speaking. I'm a believer in the night watchman state, so I believe their duty is to I agree. <laughs> uh, to protect and to uh, and culture. That's about it. Borders, language, and culture. That's all you need for a nation. If you don't have those, you don't have a country, and if your state doesn't protect those, uh, there's no reason for the state, but that's it, just protect the country. Thank you. 